Welcome to the Stop and Think series. This is a continuation of Lesson 7 on gaslighting tactics in the media. In Part 1 we covered the shock reaction, mock reaction, inflicting guilt, applying a negative connotation, false authority, poisoning the well, and attacking strengths. And today we'll go over other tactics beginning with number 7, weaponized hypocrisy. Now what is weaponized hypocrisy? This is when a person applies boldness and confidence to their blatant hypocrisy in order to get you to believe the liar. Now why does this tactic even work? The reason this tactic works is because people have an innate disbelief that a person can be so hypocritical or evil. For example, how many people do you know refuse to believe that the US government had a hand in the 9-11 attacks simply because they said to themselves, our government would never do that to us. Nobody is that evil. Well, this is exactly why weaponized hypocrisy is so successful. People will not believe the obvious hypocrisy because they cannot imagine a person being so hypocritical or evil. And the gaslighter capitalizes on this doubt to not only continue with boldness and confidence, but worse, they will project it as a weapon onto their opponents. And here's a modern example for you. And where did it come from? This is an internal document from the Hillary Clinton campaign. And it was, it was, it was created, Hillary Clinton for president consultant team, guy named Pete Brodnitz. This is from June 26, 2015. And this is from an internal poll they did on the horse race and it's from, called top, from Top Line Results. So if you look where that arrow po points, that's the, the conclusion of their internal polling was that Secretary Clinton's top vulnerability as tested in this poll is the attack that claims that as Secretary of State, she signed off on a deal that gave the Russian government control over 20% of Americans' uranium production after investors in the deal donated over $140 million to the Clinton Foundation, just like Dylan Radigan just said. And by the way, Bill Clinton also got a half million dollars from a Kremlin-connected bank at the same time as this deal was going through, and that was among his highest paid speeches of his life. So that's real. So that's a real connection. Her internal polling showed that that was her biggest vulnerability because half of all likely voters are less likely to support Clinton after hearing that statement, and 17% were much less likely to support. So they said that was her biggest vulnerability. And what do you do with your vulnerability? You throw it on your, your opponent. Also, what is your opponent's biggest strength? You attack it. When John Kerry ran against George Bush, he was a war hero. He had purple hearts and a bronze star. They attacked his purple hearts. They said they were all fake. He got them when he was running away. His guys who worked with him on the swift boat hated him. That's where they attacked his strength. And so Donald Trump's biggest strength was his patriotism. So they fucking take her biggest vulnerability and they throw it on his biggest strength. And that was a decision made by John fucking Podesta. And how do I know that because here it is 12 21 12 2015 so just a few months after that internal report donald trump starts to surge at the end of 2015 he starts to surge and they start to get scared so if you read that part in blue at the bottom what it says is the best approach is to slaughter donald for his bromance with putin that's from december 20 fucking 15 after the june thing so there you go. That's where this comes from. Now with this, I will give a piece of advice. Never assume that people have good intentions. This assumption makes you incredibly vulnerable to manipulators. Because once you believe people have good intentions behind whatever they say or do, you will therefore automatically believe that there is some truth in a total lie. And this belief will prevent a person from being able to detect a weaponized hypocrisy. But wait, there's more, and it gets even deeper. Because the overall goal of this weaponized hypocrisy is to weaponize you, to turn a sheep into a weapon. All they need is a sheep who believes that people have good intentions. And with the bold hypocrisy, the sheep therefore believes 
there is a smidgen of truth in a total lie. And with the projected hypocrisy of blaming everything on the opponent, the sheep believes there is a smidgen of truth to the false blame on the opponent. And over time, and with enough repetition of the lie, the sheep itself will falsely blame a large chunk of everything on the opponent, spreading the big lie, throwing the innocent under the bus, and much more. And now for tactic number eight, aggressive denial. There are many ways an aggressive denial can manifest, but the three most common ways are first, the doubling down. This happens when a person consistently doubles down on a narrative that is already shown to be false. For example, Hillary Clinton's attempt to tout her foreign policy experience hounded her again on the campaign trail today. I made, uh, you know, I uh, made a, a mistake in, in describing it. I she claimed she misspoke I last week and was sleep deprived when she described landing under sniper fire in Tuzla, Bosnia, something that didn't happen. But CBS News has found several times in the past few months when Senator Clinton used the Bosnia trip to try to show her international experience. December in Iowa. You know, we landed in one of those corkscrew landings and ran out because they said there might be sniper fire. I don't remember anybody offering me tea on the tarmac when that was happening. Then in February. The welcoming ceremony had to be moved inside because of sniper fire. And last week. And, uh, I remember landing under sniper fire. We basically were told to run to our cars. Now that is what happened. After CBS News video showed what really happened when she landed and greeted officials, Senator Clinton maintained there were risks but explained to the Philadelphia Daily News why she was seen on the Bosnian tarmac greeting a young child if it was really so dangerous. I was also told that the greeting ceremony had been moved away from the uh, tarmac, but that there was this eight-year-old girl, and I said, well, I, have, I, can't, I can't rush by her. I've got to at least greet her. So I greeted her, I took her stuff, and I left. Now that's my memory of it. Good to see you. Once again, her memory doesn't match our videotape. <laughs> she and her daughter Chelsea lingered on the tarmac to greet U.S. military officials, took photos. There was the group of seventh graders on the tarmac, too. And then Senator Clinton walked to the armored vehicle where she did eventually duck and enter. This other form of aggressive denial is more subtle. It's called shooting the messenger, also known as the flak machine. This next clip about manufacturing consent goes over how the flak machine operates. How does the establishment manage the media? That's the third filter. Yee. Journalism cannot be a check on power because the very system encourages complicity. Yee. Governments, corporations, big institutions know how to play the media game. They know how to influence the news narrative. They feed media scoops, official accounts, interviews with the experts. They make themselves crucial to the process of journalism. So those in power and those who report on them are in bed with each other. If you want to challenge power, you'll be pushed to the margins. Your name won't be down. You won't be getting in. You've lost your access. You've lost the story. When the media, journalists, whistleblowers, sources, stray away from the consensus, they get flat. That's the fourth filter. When the story is inconvenient for the powers that be, you'll see the flat machine in action, discrediting sources, trashing stories, and diverting the conversation. So remember, as this clip showed, the corporate media system does not reward exposure, but rewards complicity. And the corporate media is in bed with the government and all the other corporate institutions. So investigative journalism is definitely not rewarded by corporate media outlets. It is attacked by corporate media outlets. And this is why investigative journalism is dead, because it's the flak machine that killed it. So when you see the flak machine in operation, Ask yourself why they are shooting the messenger and silencing the message. The third form of aggressive denial comes in the form of poisoning the source. 
While this tactic of poisoning the source has been around for ages, the most sweeping campaign of this kind occurred last year under the guise of fake news. This particular aggressive denial tactic of poisoning the source as fake news was invented by Hillary Clinton with an overarching strategy of making sure that any competitors of the corporate networks are disregarded by you and me. In other words, we know that six major corporations own and control everything you see on TV, and these six networks are fully bribed and compliant. And so this fake news campaign is to convince everyone that anything outside of the scope of these six major networks is in quote-unquote danger of being quote-unquote fake news and therefore something to be feared. It is attaching a feeling of emotional security upon their mega corporate brand while also injecting a feeling of insecurity upon any competing brand, scaring the public into supporting their information monopoly. And now for the next tactic. Number nine, the unestablished premise. The media networks have figured out how to manufacture a quote-unquote fact out of thin air. And it involves three steps. Step one, mass repetition and syndication. Repeat it all the time and everywhere. Step two, use a false authority to push it. This was covered more in tactic number four where instead of using evidence as authority, they use their authority as evidence. And step number three, use this as an unestablished premise in future discussions. Now, I'll give you an example of this. Step one, quote, Iraq has weapons of mass destruction, repeated all the time and everywhere. Step two, all 16 intelligence agencies confirm that Iraq has weapons of mass destruction. If we had known the intelligence was wrong, yeah. we would not have gone into Iraq. But the intelligence community, all 16 agencies, assured us that it was right. And now for step three. This is where the conversation jumps. Do we go in and invade Iraq, or do we allow Saddam to wreak havoc with his weapons of mass destruction? and they will have these full panel discussions where they'll rigorously debate, but every side will assume the premise that Iraq has WMDs, even though the premise is unestablished. And this is how they fool you. You see, their goal is to quickly evolve the narrative into assuming a false premise before anyone catches on that the premise is bullshit. Because they know that the more they assume a bullshit narrative in their arguments, the more people will automatically believe that the assumed narrative must be legitimate. And so remember these two principles. Number one, the more a narrative is syndicated by corporate networks, the greater probability of bullshit. And the reason for this is because they know that the narrative cannot sell itself and therefore instead they have to somehow push it and shove it down your throats. The more they push it, the more it's bullshit. And then for present principle number two, the faster a narrative shifts or evolves, the greater probability of bullshit. Now currently the fastest evolving narrative is the Trump-Russia collusion story. Every other day, there's a new nothing burger that is totally manufactured to resurrect this old narrative. And keep in mind what we learned earlier, that this narrative was created by John Podesta in December 2015, a whole year before anyone voted. So that they can quickly push this unestablished premise, then jump to something else, and say, Well, since Trump colluded with the Russians, we should impeach Trump! And so you see how that one works. And now for the next gaslighting tactic. Containing dialogue through the use of derogatory terms. To understand how and why this tactic works, we'll go back to an earlier quote. When a narcissist can no longer control you, they will instead try to control how others see you. 
Remember that people are by nature social creatures, and our ego is very much attached to our social reputation. So we will bend and conform to preserve this social reputation. And how this tactic works is you have a series of derogatory labels to use at your disposal once a person is no longer compliant. And I'll give this quote here. The smart way to keep people passive and obedient is to strictly limit the spectrum of acceptable opinion, but allow a very lively debate within that spectrum. These labels can be anything from conspiracy theorist or racist or sexist. Now, the earliest I could find of this containing dialogue through the use of derogatory terms goes back to the 1960s with a man named Carol Quigley. And he said, the arguments that the two parties should represent opposed ideals and policies, one perhaps of the right and the other of the left, is a foolish idea acceptable only to doctrinaire or academic thinkers. Instead, the two parties should be almost identical so that the American people can throw the rascals out to any election without leading to any profound or extensive shifts in policy. That's from uh, Carol Quigley's book, Tragedy and Hope. So uh, who is this Carol Quigley anyway? Well, Carol Quigley happens to be Bill Clinton's mentor at Georgetown University. And then as a student at Georgetown, I heard that call clarified by a professor named Carol Quigley. Now, why is this significant? Well, I'm just going to put this picture up here and let you figure it out on your own. This is a photo from 1983. George Wallace and his wife are visiting two people at a party. The reason this is significant is because we have a one-party system by design and anyone outside of the spectrum will be labeled a derogatory term. And not only are the candidates labeled derogatory terms like unelectable or spoiler, but even those who vote outside the acceptable spectrum are labeled and blamed as well. These are deemed an even bigger enemy than those who actually cause the problem. And this is how they keep the masses in line by these manufactured derogatory labels, all they have to do is call you a name and you obey. That's how sheep people really are. And then there's the tactic of number 11, the changing or removal of information. This is a tactic that deals with screwing with people's memory in order to get people to doubt their own memory so they can keep pushing an established narrative. A lot of us experienced this with various media blackouts in the 2016 primaries, for example. Uh, Google is still manipulating search results. If you type in Hillary Clinton is to the Bing search engine, it recommends Hillary Clinton issues, Hillary Clinton is a lying crook, Hillary Clinton <laughs> is a murderess, which I didn't even know that was a word. Over on Yahoo, they recommend Hillary is a liar, Hillary is evil, and Hillary Clinton is the Antichrist. <laughs> But if you use the old Google machine, they recommend Hillary Clinton Israel, Hillary Clinton is winning, Hillary Clinton is awesome, and that is it! That is all they know about Hillary Clinton! Google has all of human knowledge at its fingertips, and it just knows Hillary is awesome. But they don't just stop at removing information. Instead, they're completely rewriting history in order to fit an earlier bullshit narrative. Rewriting after the fact just about anything you can think of. For example, instead of Seth Rich leaking the DNC data, it's Russia hacked the DNC. Instead of the Department of Homeland Security hacking the votes, it's Russia hacked the election. Oh, but it doesn't stop there. They will rewrite how Russia is to blame for Julian Assange. They will rewrite how Russia is to blame for Hillary Clinton's loss. They will rewrite how Russia is to blame for smearing Hillary Clinton on her fracking and bad environmental policies. 
They will rewrite how Russia is to blame for America's racial divide. They will rewrite how Russia is to blame for Black Lives Matter. They will rewrite how Russia was trying to co-opt this protest and that protest. They will rewrite how Russia is to blame for the Dakota Access Pipeline protest. They will rewrite any and all activism with some kind of Russian spin. Why aren't I 50 points ahead? See Russians, Putin, R Russia, Russia. Why aren't I 50 points ahead? The Kremlin, Putin, and the Russian government. Why aren't I 50 points ahead? Russian, Putin, the Russians, Russia, the Kremlin, the Russians, Putin, Russia, Russia, Russia. But wait, it doesn't stop there. They will launch official investigations just to push along these bullshit narratives, such as when they launched an investigation on Jill Stein. They will even try to say Russia hacked Pokemon Go to fix the election. And these rewritings still continue to this day. If you post any narrative, or meme, or hashtag that runs contrary to the mainstream media, it will be rewritten as Russia being behind it, and you just might be a Russian troll. But wait, there's more. They will blame just about anything on Russian bots, including their own sexual misconduct. They will even manufacture fake stories of people discovering Russian agents on social media. They will ask you questions to scare you, have you interacted with Russian agents? They'll ask questions of, Can Facebook stop this? Now, stop and think for a moment. Facebook is not doing this to stop Russia from giving Facebook advertising dollars. Facebook is doing this to stop you. To stop activists. Not just to smear you, but to censor anything that goes against their narrative. They will stop at nothing to censor you. And the ultimate goal of this tactic of changing and removal of information is to stop people from trusting their own instincts. To convince everyone that trusting their gut feelings is fake news and that only they possess the real news. They will attack your instincts. They will attack your memory. They will attack your emotions. They will attack your sense of identity, they will attack your sense of reality, and they will even attack you through your own friends. And this is what leads us to the last tactic, the bait and switch. The first thing to do in this bait and switch tactic, when you're doing this yourself, is to create infiltrators, to create fake friends in mass numbers. and have these fake friends add people on social media. Now you may think, wait, this is crazy, creating fake friends. Yes, it is crazy, and as crazy as it sounds, it is something very common. It's called astroturfing. And this business of creating fake friends is common practice for astroturfing, which has become so common for big corporations to hire these astroturfers that astroturfing has grown into its own industry. And not just any industry, but an industry with a presence in Washington with its own lobbyists. Now, the purpose of this bait and switch is to, through these fake friends, generate a fake trend and a fake bandwagon, as well as a fake betrayal. So this tactic is all about mass infiltration. And this bait and switch tactic isn't the ordinary astroturfing where they're trying to sell you a product. Its purpose is to screw with their minds in the most severe way imaginable, infiltrating everything so, the, so that you can slowly and systematically have everyone suddenly switch sides and betray them at the opportune moment, to have many of their friends suddenly turn into these mindless zombies and have them parroting mind-numbing narratives. Hillary is so qualified. Hillary is not corrupt. The Clinton Foundation is wonderful. All to generate a fake trend and a fake betrayal. Because your job or goal with this gaslighting tactic is to make them feel crazy. But that's not all. 
to have your infiltrators organize events only to sabotage and cancel them at the last minute. To have your infiltrators organize large social media groups only to suddenly switch sides and turn them into a herding ground for your candidate. To have your infiltrating journalists suddenly turn on them. To have their other favorite politicians suddenly turn on them and campaign for you. To have infiltrating celebrities suddenly turn on them and mock them. But that's not all. Corrupt their media outlets. Co-opt their environmental groups. Co-opt their protest groups. Corrupt their leaders. Co-opt their organizations. Dash their hopes, mock their dreams, coerce their leader into endorsing your candidate, make him campaign for you, make him deny all your wrongdoing, make him parrot your propaganda, make him push for your wars, make him tour the country and promote you, make his followers wonder whose side he's really on. Because giving a false hope is much more effective gaslighting than giving no hope at all. And repeat this false hope over and over. Twist the knife. Turn their hero into their villain. Make him piss on every good thing that his followers once stood for. And then have this fake friend army of yours switch sides and cultishly defend this new sellout. Make them wish that they never entered politics to begin with. This is the bait-and-switch tactic. That wraps up this lesson on gaslighting tactics in the media. We have the shock reaction, mock reaction, inflicting guilt, applying a negative connotation, false authority, poisoning the well, attacking strengths, weaponized hypocrisy, aggressive denial, the unestablished premise, containing dialogue through derogatory terms, the changing or removal of information, and the bait and switch. That's all. I'll see you next time.